Good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. And again, um, thank you so much for your patience and understanding um, for, the, for the last minute swap out, but we're so appreciative and thankful. Um, Scott Lumpkin, um, he is a, he's a consultant with nonprofit organizations and individuals on um, transformation philanthropic strategies. Um, he works with advancement leaders um, from across the country. He um, served as the um, vice president at the University of Denver and led them through their comprehensive funding raising campaign, and he's a nationally recognized expert on the field of charitable gift planning and regularly works with boards, individuals, fundraising teams, and others on helping make sure that individuals um, make the most of their finances and um, their, their impact. Um, Scott holds a Bachelor of Science in math Mathematics and as well as an MBA um, from the University of Denver. So let's please give Scott a very warm so, welcome yeah. for stepping in at the last minute. <laughs> Tim, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for the welcome. I really appreciate it. And uh, happy. I, I know when you know, last minute things um, happen, so not a problem. I've actually um, spent time yesterday um, with um, part of the advancement team um, here at Rice. And so um, just always um, love the opportunity, so I um, have a chance, uh, usually um, at, at least once a year, to come and uh, be here. But I feel I'm very much at, at home with you all because for 32 years, um, I spent um, time at a very similar university, which is the University of Denver. So a mid-sized private. I heard that. I was, Yay, is that right? Awesome, what year is she? And how's she doing? Loves it? Is she gonna study abroad next year? And where's she gonna go? Awesome. So the University of Denver, so very similar in a lot of ways to Rice. I mean, in fact, that's so. It's in fact we you know get a lot of students coming from Houston that kind of you know you would have you know similar cross applications um, for that. One of the things about the University of Denver that's kind of become really special in recent years is the study abroad program, to where so the university. And basically makes it possible for every single undergraduate to study abroad for an extended period of time. The university even pays for the airfare. So consequently, it's just kind of vaulted DU into kind of the, some of the top schools in terms of study abroad. So my three kids um, went to the University of Denver as well. And so I hope you're pl making plans to go over. So smart mom, smart parent. So good deal. Well, the other reason why, um, so again, I spend so much time um, at a very similar university, love being with, with alumni, and love the fact that you all have taken part of a Saturday um, to come and learn, because um, life is all about keeping on learning. And so no matter where we are in life, you know, that's part of the reason why we, why we um, stay connected with a university like Rice, is because we want to learn, we want to keep on learning. There's also another special reason why for me that, that why I especially feel right at home today is because actually this is home. I was born at Herman Hospital. So <laughs> this is about as close to home home as you can get. And I had uh, my grandparents lived in West University. Um, so just you know five, five, 10 minutes away. And uh, so again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I went on Google Maps not too long ago and tried to, tried to see I mean, look at my parents, uh, my grandparents' um, address in West University, and of course, their house isn't there anymore. <laughs> it's long gone, I think, and what's in its place looks nothing like what I remember, you know, as a little kid. It's like, whoa, something happened to the neighborhood. It's just kind of amazing. Um, so, that's that's uh, enough, kind of about. Um, my background. Let me ask just for um, a quick show of hands, how many of you all are Rice alumni? Yes. Awesome. So go Owls. So I'm so excited, again, that you all are, are here um, today. Um, so uh, let me ask you, how many, are, how many of you, are you all within, say, an hour's drive? Anybody, anybody farther out than an hour's drive? Okay. Awesome. Wonderful um, that you'll have, have taken time to, to come out, so welcome. And um, I guess, I don't know if the heavens are gonna open up. Um, it looks like maybe rain, but we're in a wonderful dry place. Kudos, by the way, to, to Rice for building such a phenomenal facility um, to house for continuing ed and lifelong learning. It's just awesome. 
So let's get going. The reason why we wanted to talk today um, about this topic is because we knew that it would be fresh on your minds. <laughs> right? Okay, just okay now, show, show of hands, is there anybody who hasn't filed their taxes yet? Why are you here? No. <laughs> well, that's actually a pretty big number. Okay, so this is good. This is good. And so for the rest of you that have filed your taxes, did you have any surprises? No? Okay. Some of you, I think probably for most of us, you know, when you filed your taxes, they were like, well, this is different. You know, for a lot of Americans, the new tax, the new tax act brought some tremendous changes. And so that's really what we wanted to talk about today, about the changes. I want to give you the highlights. By the way, I am not a tax attorney. As Dan mentioned, I, I have a degree in math and an MBA, but I work, I've worked with a lot of people around <laughs> tax planning, and specifically philanthropic planning. So I'm going to give you the highlights. Happy that we can talk, um, ask questions. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll say, go talk to your accountant. Um, so I do that, but happy to hit the highlights. For those of you, whether you filed or you haven't filed, my hope is to give you some planning tips and just to help make a little bit more sense of the new tax act in a way that will either help you now or certainly help you going forward um, as, you, as you think about um, your plans next. So what are we gonna cover? We're gonna cover the biggest changes in the new tax law. We're gonna talk about why two thirds of taxpayers are paying less for 2018 for why tax deductions or what tax deductions were eliminated or reduced in the new tax law. Deductions you can claim even if you don't itemize. Retirement planning in 2019. Five things that you must know. And the little known tax change that could affect your tax return. And then lastly, tips for effective charitable planning. So let's jump into it. So increased benefits of the new tax law. I think probably all of you all have heard one of the biggest single changes is with the standard deduction. And the standard deduction has doubled. So it's gone to for a single person. Um, and these are now the 2019 numbers. This is not 2018, so these are the 2019 numbers. Doubled to 12,200 for a single person or 24,400 for someone who's married. For people who are 65 and older, there's an additional bump. Um, for a single person, it's 1,650, 1,650 is added on top of that. Or for a married couple, $1,300 apiece gets added on. So that really bumps it up. The impact of the standard deduction doubling is huge. Let me put it into perspective. There are millions upon millions of taxpayers right this tax season um, who took the standard deduction for the first time possibly ever. The numbers have gone, have gone from 37% of, and these are projections, we won't know exactly, obviously, until we get the numbers from the IRS and the Treasury, but the estimates is that it dropped from about 37%, more than a third of taxpayers taking the, taking the itemized deductions, dropping down to 14%, one in seven. That's huge, or said differently, think about it, that means that 85%, 85% of taxpayers will be taking the standard deduction. This is, this is transforming a huge, huge change in how we think about taxes and how tax professionals approach it. So that's the, that's the number one change. We're going to talk about the implications of that. Secondly, expanded child credit. So the, the child credit has also doubled, went from 1,000 up to 2,000, but now it's also refundable. So for lower income families, um, if they, they can take the child credit and actually get money back before it wasn't refundable. So in other words, if they didn't have at least as high a tax liability as the credit, you know, then they wouldn't get back anything extra. But here, up to 1,400 of the tax credit is actually refundable. It phases out, but the phase out has also been way increased. Before it would start phasing out for couples at 110,000 of income every year, now it, it, the phase out um, is up to 400,000. So it encompasses a lot more families. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing. That's one of the reasons why a lot of taxpayers with, with families um, are paying less. 
Also, 529 education accounts. This is brand new for the first time. It's that the law allows up to 10,000 to be used for private school tuition. Because remember before, 529 plans could only be used for colleges and universities, college and university um, tuition. But now, 529 plans up to 10,000 can be used for private school tuition. That's a, that's a big new benefit. Okay, those are the three big, big pieces, um, if you will. You, again, you probably had heard of the standard deduction. A lot of people haven't heard about the child credit or the 529. Um, oh, and then the last one, um, I almost forgot, estate tax deduction. The estate tax exemption also doubles. And it doubles now so that a single person can exempt, can transfer up to $11.4 million, or a married couple can transfer up to $22.8 million. Now, wow, no matter how you look at it, that's a lot of money. Right? And so let's put this into perspective. $22.8 million for a couple, that, that level um, of wealth is, is at the less than 1%. That's at, that's at the 99 plus percent level of wealth in the United States. Said differently, that means that less than 1% of taxpayers in the United States have wealth in excess of $22.8 million. So just to kind of keep that in mind, especially, you know, when we get into, as we're going into the craziness of the next presidential electoral cycle, you know, and we start getting hyperbole thrown from all sides, you know, one of the things inevitably is somebody will talk about the estate tax or the death tax. And so just keep it into perspective. Under, under this law, this exempts 99% plus of all tax holders, all wealth holders in the United States. Now these provisions are set to expire in 2025, but you know Congress, inevitably, they, they, they rarely let things like this totally expire. It'll be interesting to see what happens, but it is set to sunset um, at that time. So let's talk then about just real briefly tax rates. And, and uh, don't groan, it's like, oh, brother, this is gonna do math um, here. No, I, I, I put it, I wanted you to see, for everybody, for all of this just to be on the same page of how the tax brackets work. Because frankly, for most of us, whether we're using TurboTax or going to an accountant, most people don't realize how the tax bracket system actually works. So, here we go, this is the tax brackets for a single individual. We have what's called a marginal tax um, system, as opposed to a flat um, tax. And the, the basics of it are that with a marginal tax system, that means that the tax rates go up at different margins, at different places. And only the dollars above that respective margins get taxed that way. So let's you know, look at our, our example. So the way the brackets work um, here, and this is again is 2019, is that the first $9,700 of taxable income. By the way, this is not adjusted gross income, right? Remember on your taxes, you first have your adjusted gross income, basically everything is added together, and then you take out the standard deduction or the itemized deduction, right? And that gives you taxable income. So these, the, the rates are applied to taxable income. That's actually what gets taxed. So, the first 9,700 of taxable income gets taxed at 10%. The next from 9,701 to 39,475 gets taxed at 12%, okay? And then from there, between 39,476 to 84,200 gets taxed at 22%. And so on, all the way up to the top bracket is 37%, okay? So, question for you, somebody, so, you know, somebody will say, well, what tax bracket am I in? Well, that's, what does that really mean? Because it's, you're really in multiple tax brackets, but what they're asking is, what is their highest tax bracket? So, question for you, somebody who has a taxable income of $100,000, what tax bracket would they be in? 24, exactly, thank you. 
That's right. And so it's not, that doesn't mean that their entire taxable income is taxed at 24%. It just means that their last dollars, their most recent um, dollars, their up, upper dollars, are taxed at that, at that rate. And so each additional dollar of income at that point within that bracket would get taxed at 24%. Okay? Questions? Questions on how, on how the brackets work? And these are pretty similar. They changed, they changed a little bit from last year. What happens is that you'll see the movement in the brackets themselves, um, I mean, in the, in the dollars. So they will adjust the dollars. So the rates themselves don't change that much, but the dollars do. OK, so that's the single one. Let's look real quickly. Here's, at Mar here's the married equivalent. And you can see it's basically double. Let me go back again. There's single. So you see we go 9,700, 39,475 on up. Look, here's married. 19,478, and so they double pretty close at the beginning, but then it starts slowing down um, from there. So married couples actually do go into higher tax brackets more quickly um, than singles. That's what's called, have you ever heard of the marriage penalty? That's the marriage penalty of that married couples go faster into upper brackets, and, and that's just the way it works. Okay. So let's jump forward then and take a quick look, though, at capital gain and qualified dividend tax rates because these are different, right? So this is, this is how anything, so capital gains, if you sell a piece of, uh, if you sell a piece of property, if you sell stocks that you've owned that have gone up in value, they are taxed differently than regular income, which, by the way, is called ordinary income. Let me go back again. These rates, these are what's called ordinary income. And so that's the, that's the income that someone is taxed on from, from earnings, et cetera. So, but here we're talking about capital gains and qualified dividend tax rates. So if you are retired and you are, you are living off of capital gains and dividends, these are largely the rates that are going to apply. Now you'll notice something, though, really interesting. Let me ask you, what jumps out to you? What's different about these tax rates? What do you see? They're less, right? They're less of the earned income tax rates. Not only are they less, what, what happens? There's no marriage penalty, and the taxes don't even kick in at all, right? Remember, on our earned income, ordinary income, the tax starts on, on taxable income right at 10%. But look here. In this case, that there's actually zero tax, zero tax, in on the first almost 40,000 for a single and 78,000, 754 for a married couple. Whoa, huge planning opportunity. And so I'm reading more and more that for people who are retired and don't have earned income, this represents a real smart opportunity to start thinking about. Because a lot of times when in your retirement, sort of the, the default is to say, oh, let's go totally tax exempt. Let's completely avoid tax. You know, we're going to go all municipal bonds. But if that misses the opportunity, because now the way the taxes work for a married couple, they can have up to 78,000 of capital gains. And these are long-term capital gains, right? These are gains on property that you've held for at least a year. So the tax on that, up to 78,750, zero tax. So smart planning opportunity it may not make sense to totally put everything in tax-free, just to try to chase those tax-free dollars, especially at a time when interest rates are you know, still very, very low historically. You can find good, good um, tax-free rates, but don't exclude, don't miss the opportunity to keep to remember that qualified dividends and capital gains are taxed at a lower rate. Everybody follow? Questions on that? Okay. This, I think, is a really important tool, important tip that a lot of us might miss. Yes, sir? Could you remind me what the difference is, what qualified dividends? Yeah. 
And I don't know this, the, I, have, I have misplaced and forgotten the actual definition, but most tradition, the effect is that most traditional dividends, so if you're in, in a mutual fund that's, that's generating it, I know for me, the majority of my investments, mutual funds, the majority of the dividends end up being qualified dividends. So I think they're traditional, like traditional corporate dividends, traditional corporate U.S. stock, um, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, you can, and, and actually that would be, even if you filed, this actually would be a good, good note. Write down, make a note, I'd encourage you, go back, take a look, go back and pull out your taxes and look at your statement from your brokerage um, firm, financial, um, you know, from whatever you use, go back and look, and, and, and actually you can look on your tax returns as well. Look on the front page of, of the IRS 1040, and you will see it will show total dividends and then qualified dividends. Those numbers, I think, will be very close um, to each other. And so, yeah, you can just go back and look. But I think for the typical investor today, the majority of the dividends they receive are actually qualified. Okay. Now, the bad news. What deductions were eliminated in 2018? Well, this was a big one, especially for people with children. This is kind of what the child tax credit helped make up. But there, remember, there was a personal exemption. That Remember that we could, we could um, deduct or claim a personal exemption of over $4,000 per person in your household. If you're like my oldest son, who has four kids, you know that, wow, with he and his wife, they had six exemptions that they could claim. And so the child tax credit helps them make up for that. But this was one of the things that was eliminated. Secondly, interest on home equity loans or lines, lines of credit eliminated. Here's the deduction that a lot of people is a total surprise because most people did not realize miscellaneous expenses are no longer deductible. In particular, tax advice and prep fees, investment related expenses. So you know that fee that you pay for your investment advisor or to Schwab or Fidelity or TIA or whoever that manages your investments, those are no longer deductible. So that's a big change that has really affected. This is one of those nasty surprises um, for folks that, whoa, wait a second, you mean that you know, all those dollars that I pay in investment management fees, those are no longer deductible? No, that's right, they're not. Other deductions that were eliminated in 2018, casualty losses, moving expenses, alimony payments, um, no longer deductible or reportable. Um, as income going forward. That doesn't affect divorce or separation agreements prior to 2018, but you know, after 2018, um, they're not deductible anymore. So let's talk though about deductions that were reduced, not eliminated, but reduced in 2018. This is probably the biggest one, state and local income taxes. Because as of 2018, and this includes income sales property tax, right? So for states like Texas that don't have an income tax, but you have big property taxes, right? And so this encompasses that whole umbrella. So starting in 2018, it's capped at $10,000. And so this is providing, a, this is again one of those nasty surprises that a lot of folks are saying, whoa, wait a second, you mean I, I can only deduct $10,000 of my state and local income taxes? So that's having a real impact. However, as I've noted there, previously, it was previously unlimited, although a lot of taxpayers who were subject to the alternative minimum tax lost the benefit of those deductions. That they would basically get phased out through the AMT. So I think it's gonna take, some, it's gonna take a while. We're gonna have to actually go all the way through this tax season and then get some analysis back to actually try to get a sense. Um, but at least, um, you know, the, the concern is that for people who have high state, local um, income property sales tax um, deductions previously, that that could have a real effect. Secondly, interest on supersized mortgages. Remember before it was unlimited, now interest is deductible on new loans. This is only new loans, doesn't affect old loans. New loans, now only up to 750000 um, down from one million. I'm sorry, I said it was unlimited. That's a few years ago, they, they put in uh, the cap at one million. So they ratcheted it down. Um, and then secondly, as I mentioned, interest on existing loans remains deductible. Okay, here's, an, here's kind of a side question for you. Um, what do you remember the, the whole idea of the mortgage interest deduction. Why was it put in place? 
in the first place? What was the purpose of the mortgage interest deduction? To encourage home buyers, right. And remember when, when it was put in place, um, which was what, probably shortly after World War II, um, when, when you know, they were, the whole idea was to encourage home, home buying. So, so the mortgage interest deduction was put into place. And obviously that did its job for a long time. What's going to happen now? I read an interesting article the other day that, that it was actually an opinion piece the other day in the Wall Street that was saying, you know, maybe it's time to actually change the system and get rid of the mortgage interest deduction. And the author was basically saying now, with the standard deduction being so high that the vast majority of homeowners, it's really not applicable. They don't get any benefit from it, especially, for instance, first-time home buyers, you know, millennials trying to get, in, get into the housing market. So this author was saying maybe it's time to change the system and go to like a, you know, a one-time credit um, or something for home buyers, maybe for first-time home buyers. I don't know. I, that just struck me as interesting um, and something to think about because at this point, it's really only very, very high income taxpayers with high, with big mortgages um, that are really taking advantage of it. Um, so, you know, that's kind of one of those policy questions that, that you kind of just have to say, huh, okay, that'll be interesting to watch. So, um, something just to keep in mind. All right, how about deductions that you can claim? So since 85% of us now are no longer um, itemizing, what are some deductions that we can claim even if you don't itemize? Let's take a look at them. Number one, educator expenses. This is interesting to me. So educators can still claim up to $250. I know that's not a big number, um, but for those of you who are teachers, um, then you can actually claim those expenses. Yahoo, I, mean, I think that's a great, you know, at least that, that's, a, that's a nod to the importance um, of educators. Um, secondly, and this is the big one, IRA contributions, right? Does not matter, you don't have to itemize and they're significant dollars. So, for both traditional and Roth IRAs, that you can contribute up to $6,000. For someone who's 50 or older, there's the catch-up contributions of an additional $1,000, so $7,000. How long can you contribute um, to an IRA? Well, if we're talking about a traditional IRA, you can give up to age 70 and a half. How about for a Roth? No limit. You can be 99 and still keep putting dollars in. My mother-in-law, who will be 95 um, in, in the fall, she could be you know, putting dollars into a Roth IRA. So huge, huge opportunities there. And again, just to remind ourselves, how about health savings accounts? Similarly, you don't have to deduct. So now you generally have to be, you have to be um, earning um, you have to be in a, in a uh, you know, have to have earnings, but you can put in up to thirty-four fifty as a single or sixty-eight fifty, six thousand eight hundred fifty, into an HSA. Great opportunity to reduce taxes and help health care costs. Last, and then self-employment tax. If you're self-employed, or even if you're self-employed um, part-time, um, you can deduct. So self-employment taxes come off whether or not you um, itemize deductions. And then lastly, again, if you're self-employed, health insurance premiums. So health insurance premiums. And then finally, student loan interest. Yeah, interestingly, deductible up to 2,500 if they're AGI. AG AGI is what? Adjusted gross income. Remember, that's on the front page. So deductible up to 2,500 if AGI is less than 80,000 single or 165,000 married. So if you have student loan debt um, or have you know, no uh, people who do or kids, uh, whatever, this is um, actually a great opportunity. All right, let's talk about retirement planning in 2019 and dig a little bit deeper on IRAs. Remember, there's two different kinds of IRAs, traditional and Roth. Remember the difference um, is that the traditional IRA, you take a deduction for contributions, but you pay the tax on withdrawals. So tax benefit up on the front, and then, but then you t it's get taxed on the tail end. And the tax, by the way, is at those ordinary income rates. So remember our tax brackets back on that we looked at earlier? Those are the tax brackets. Here's a nasty surprise. Most people don't know. 
What does anybody know what happens if you leave a traditional IRA to your kids? What happens? Does anybody know? Uh, somebody said it. They get taxed. Right. Right. The tax doesn't go away. Because remember, just as when you pull dollars out from a traditional IRA, if you give it to your kids, when they pull it out, um, they get taxed um, on those. So just important, just remember, now they can, just as you, they can stretch it out, um, but it is taxable um, to them. So that's a traditional IRA. Roth IRA, no, no deduction up front, but there's no tax on the withdrawals. So it's just a flip. There's the flip side of the two. So those are the two options um, with, and there's pros and cons, benefits of both, but just remember the two differences. And then the, there is an earned income requirement. You have to have earnings to contribute to an IRA. And there are contribution limits, and so I've put these up here for you. So under age 50, 6,000, 50 and older, 7,000. And again, like I said, contributions allowed up to 70 and a half for traditional, no limit on Roths. So a few more things on retirement planning. There are also income limits. So there's a maximum um, income, and I showed you in the phase out. So for a traditional um, IRA, the maximum income you can have and still contribute is 74,000. Starts getting phased out at 64,000, okay? And as I noted, the deductibility also depends on whether or not you have access. So there's complicated rules. If you have access to a 401k, 403b, it further limits what you can put into an IRA. And, but on the Roth um, contributions, higher maximums. So for a single person, they can go up to 137,000. So that's great. So even if somebody can't do a traditional, they may be able to do a Roth um, based on their income. Um, levels. So again, just because they miss one, they can go up to the next one. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a industry manager. Get out this quite often. Which one is preferable? Right. And, you know, I, I think the question, and thank you for asking the question, because you're right, that's what everybody asks. Which is better? Which should I do? And I don't think that anybody can answer it definitively because the answer depends on what will tax rates be when you pull, when you pull them out. So it kind of depends on your own crystal ball. So polish up your crystal ball and kind of say, all right, do I think the tax rates are going to be higher or lower you know, when I retire and I'm going to have to start I'm taking them out? Now, um, I personally have both. So I have both traditional IRAs, um, and then I also have a Roth IRA. Um, I, you know, I, I can, there's, again, there's value in both of them. Um, but, but it really depends, my understanding, is that it kind of depends on, wow, what's going to happen down the road? If you're really trying to, um, if, you know, if you really want to, want to hedge your bets and just say, you know, I, I just don't want to take the chance, go for the Roth. Uh, because the Roth, at, at least, you know, it's clear no matter what. You can say, you know, I don't know. I don't want to take the chance that tax rates are going to be actually higher, um, you know, when I pull it out. So I'm going to go with the Roth, and I'm just going to forego the benefits um, today. Part of me actually leans that way. And I kind of like the idea of being able to say, you know, I don't care so much about tax benefits today. I'm still going to get tax-free compounding. And so it's still going to grow tax-free. So personally, I actually kind of like that, um, like that approach. Yeah, thought? Um, yeah, and also there is uh, the ability, as you mentioned, the mother can also contribute up to 70. Exactly. And there's no RMD requirement. Exactly. That's right. There's no RMD requirement, and you can leave it to kids and family and no penalty. So I, I think there's a whole bunch to say about, about Roths. Um, for me, much of what, what I did kind of with my planning kind of came because I worked in higher ed most of my life, and so kind of it sort of pushed me into qualified plans. Um, but if I was doing it today and for, for you know, my own kids, I really like the idea of a Roth. So, um, so we'll, we'll keep on, on, on going. Again, I'm happy to, to answer other questions, and um, depending on kind of what Dan wants to do as far as afterward, I may have time. Um, in uh, kind of the next session if we want to go, go deeper on things. Um, by the way, deadline for contributions, 
It's Monday, so <laughs> Monday is tax day, so you have, have two more days um, to make that. Estate tax exemption doubles, remember we talked about that already, and again, it's set to lapse in 2025. Great thing is that there's still no capital gain taxes at death. That's really good. In other words, because you have a step up, stepped up cost basis. So even for high net worth individuals, so, so you know, whatever they leave gets a stepped up cost basis. So there's no capital gain tax. The great thing is that the exemption can be shared between couples. Um, and then lastly, that annual gifts remain tax-free up to 15000 Okay, some, some tips on charitable planning, and then we'll be done. Number one tip for you, because of the standard deduction, it's important, and many of us need to start thinking about our charitable planning. Here's my number one tip for you. Start bunching your charitable gifts. What do I mean by that? If you normally have been giving charitable gifts you know, every year, whether that's to Rice or other organizations, it probably makes sense now to start bunching them. How do you do that? One of the easiest ways is to take several years worth, however many, three, five, whatever, put those into a donor advised fund, and then make grants to charity, spread those out over multiple years. But push enough into that donor advised fund so that you can itemize your deductions. So you bump it up, you get the credit for that, claim your itemized deductions in that year when you bunch them. And then as you spread them out to charity, claim the standard deduction in those off years. In that way, you're gonna get the maximum bang for the buck and still be supporting places that you believe in. So that's number one. Second, contribute appreciated assets. If you have, again, stocks, if you own Amazon or even sell Apple and that have gone up in value, as you think about gifts to your favorite organizations, give those appreciated securities. Why? Because you're going to avoid the capital gain tax. Remember, if you give appreciated assets to a charitable organization, you completely avoid the capital gain tax on it and you have the greatest impact on the organization. So given a choice between giving cash or appreciated assets, give appreciated assets. Last tip, donate your IRA RMDs. If you're 70 and a half and older, obviously if you have a traditional IRA, you have to take required minimum distributions. And the IRS has a schedule for that. Thankfully, however, now there is a law that just became permanent a couple years ago that allows you to donate your entire RMD up to $100,000 directly to charity. You can't, take it to, you can't take it yourself first. It has to be sent directly to Rice, directly to whatever the charities you're supporting. But when you do that, you completely avoid the tax, right? Because that taxable, that income never even shows up, and never even gets credited to you. So whether you're, whether you're already um, there in the RMD zone or approaching or planning for retirement as you're thinking about charitable planning, this tool is really huge. And, and, and my, my colleague, Judy, and who's part of the gift planning office here at Rice, um, and knows Rice has seen a huge influx in these kind of gifts um, this year. So people are, are understanding um, why that works. Okay, we're done with our time frame. Um, any other um, final questions? Um, again, happy to, happy to help, or if you want to catch me afterward, again, we can talk with, with Dan if um, I can, um, what, whatever we would like to do. What should we do? Alexis or Dan, I should check. Dan, what would you like to do? Do we want to, can take questions now or go next door? You tell me. Yeah, great. So Because I see those hands. And, and let me just introduce Judy Titchener. So Judy is the executive director of gift planning um, here at Rice. And she, Judy has a team of folks that I have the privilege of, of working with. And so um, they're, they're here to obviously help with any of, of your um, interests or needs with, with Rice. Judy, and if you want to add anything. Yeah, just thank you all for coming and attending this session today. Uh, we flew Scott in particularly for the 
this opportunity to speak with you and share these tips and ideas. But I'd also like to stress to you that, yes, while we help people do charitable gift planning, as well as with their complex assets, we also offer other just general service around getting, for example, you a comprehensive list of local, estate, and tax attorneys yeah. if you need their services, because we don't really do that part for you. Um, and we also have lists of trustees, uh, organizations that serve as trustees. So if you are interested in any kind of service at all, or we can help direct you to find that service, we're more than happy to do that. <coughs> Okay. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for letting me join you all on the fly and as a surprise speaker. So you're very gracious. Thanks for being here today.